Welcome, this is your five minute geography lesson. We're covering theme three, element nine, managing tectonic hazards. Surprise quiz, I'm Mr. S and I'll be your five minute teacher. Tectonic hazards can be managed in a number of ways. Managing these hazards can reduce the primary and secondary effects as well as reducing any possible human vulnerability to these hazards. We're gonna look at these in three different sections. And the first one is planning. And one element of planning is mapping out where the hazard is going to occur. And this is called hazard mapping. In the case of the maps that you can see in front, they are of a Caribbean island called Grenada. Grenada has a few different mountains and volcanoes. The one we're looking at here is Mount St. Catherine. What's happened is the government has decided to look at what has happened when this volcano has erupted in the past and try and predict where would be most likely to be hit the most should it erupt in the future. And they've moderated where the different risks would be. The two maps represent slightly different risks. So map A represents the risk of pyroclastic flow in this eruption or any subsequent eruption. So here's the mountain, the volcano itself. The darker orange represents the highest risk of pyroclastic flow and the lighter orange represents a moderate risk. You can actually see there are three main cities at risk from pyroclastic flow. So any subsequent eruption, they'd want to evacuate these different cities to make sure that nobody actually ended up in that pyroclastic flow. So you can see how a map, this hazard mapping will actually help if they knew that they were at risk of an eruption sometime soon. The second map is the overall risk that's associated with this volcano. The red represents the very high hazard risk. And again, two of these cities actually come very close to being in the very high zone. The orange represents a high hazard and the yellow represents a moderate. You can see that they've classified the green as low, but that doesn't say that it's of no risk whatsoever. You can even see that their capital city, St. George, does have a moderate risk and that will be predominantly from the ash clouds when the, uh, the prevailing winds blowing ash in that direction. So when a eruption actually occurs these maps now allow the government to say well it's going to happen any day now we're going to make sure that we're going to evacuate this town this town and this town we're going to put St George's on alert for potential disruption from ash but we're going to direct most of our emergency services further north rather than to the capital because it's further away from that uh, volcano. And then coupled with that, we've got this emergency, emergency planning. So the government's already planned what might happen. The actual emergency planning, though, will include some exclusion zones. So on here, most likely, Grenada will probably say anything in the orange or the reds, you have to leave, you have to evacuate that becomes the exclusion zone. They'll then have evacuation routes. So Victoria, this city here, will probably have to evacuate to the north if they don't have very much time. If they've got perhaps weeks and months ahead of it, they might evacuate them further south because there's a bit more space. But they'll have those routes in place should an event be likely. At home, the law, people will also be encouraged to have evacuation packs, which will have food, water, and supplies to support them if they do get trapped in these zones and might be at potential risk. And throughout this time, even without having an eruption, the government will be educating the population on what do should an event occur. This could be over TV, radio, internet, it could be in schools, and that will include what should I do when it erupts, what should I plan for, so that's my hazard pack, and where should I go to get help. The second thing we're gonna look at is monitoring. And there are a variety of different ways that we monitor depending on what the actual hazard is. So is it an earthquake? Is it a volcano? For earthquakes, particularly earthquakes that happen underwater, we want to watch out for tsunamis. This would involve having a seismometer or a tilt meter on the base of the or the bed of the sea. When it detects an earthquake, it's going to send that information to a buoy. That buoy can also detect when there's an extreme movement of waves. So if they've got a high um, wave difference than what it's expecting, this information is then relayed to satellite and then back down to a monitoring station. 
That monitoring station can send alerts out, either put tannoys and big alarms in at-risk areas on the coast, or send text messages and notifications out on TV and radio. And because it's out to sea, that wave, although it does travel fast, will still take some time to get to the coast, which allows people to evacuate to higher land. Also with earthquakes, they still use seismometers even if it wasn't in the sea, and they can measure smaller earthquakes and get notification out that if there's a lot of small earthquakes happening recently where there haven't been in the past, that might indicate that a big earthquake is about to come. They can detect radon gas. So this gas is trapped at the top of the mantle and in the lower part of the crust, and as the earth starts to move, it gets released from the crust into our atmosphere, which we can detect using sniffing equipment. We can also, on our volcanoes, measure several different movements. Sometimes volcanoes get bulges on the side when more magma is building up, and that can be detected by satellite and remote sensing. It can be detected by thermal imaging, as well as tilt meters. We also use cameras to uh, look at what's happening along at the vent, in terms of can we see smoke uh, rising from it. We can sense small tremors and earthquakes inside the volcano itself as that magma is forcing its way up. As can GPS they detect any movements on the sides of the mountain. And then we can also detect more gases such as sulfur and radon escaping from the vent as it prepares to erupt. And then finally, we've got adaptation through building new technology. Existing buildings can be retrofitted, so they can be added to, to make them more resistant. And new buildings tend to have a strict code that says this must be in place if you want to build a new building in an earthquake or a volcano prone area. Let's have a look at what happens for buildings. One thing that can be easily retrofitted on top, and it becomes standard on all tall buildings in earthquake prone areas, are these huge counterweights. They move freely on a axis from horizontal. So as the building rocks from side to side during the earthquake, these counterweights will move in the opposite direction to the motion. So if this building's rocking in this direction, these weights will move in that direction. And this helps bring the building back up straight instead of rocking too far left to right. There's automatic shutters. So all the windows, when an earthquake happens, is triggered automatically to uh, drop metal shutters through all the windows. This has two advantages. One, it stops the glass from flexing and shattering and falling down onto pedestrians below. And it also helps with the structural integrity, stopping some of the floors from collapsing in on themselves, which is called pancaking. The lifts or the shafts of the lifts are reinforced with uh, additional metal to stop them from uh, twisting and crumpling. And the lifts themselves have mechanisms on tension cable. So the cable has to be tense and it keeps these big arms, these brakes from coming out. When the cable snaps, it releases the tension and these brakes and arms stick out from the side of the car of the elevator and stick into the sides into these teeth. And that locks the elevator in place, stopping it from plummeting to the ground. The area around the building itself is designed to be open space. This means that people can be evacuated from buildings and not be at risk from falling debris or from the building collapsing itself. The foundations of these buildings are designed to absorb the shock of the earthquake. So they are built not just with concrete, but they layer it with rubber as well. And that rubber absorbs the seismic waves. And the concrete is reinforced with a lattice work of steel to try and stop the concrete from cracking and uh, falling, falling away. This is also replicated in the building itself. This is called bird caging, or you might see it in terms of where they've got metal that runs both horizontally and vertically, and they cross over each other. And that creates a really strong rigid structure. It means that the building can twist from side to side, but still retain its structure. You may also see these different uh, types of patterns in terms of like a cross design as well, which is really rigid, but allows it to twist from side to side. In terms of retrofitting existing structures, particularly infrastructure like roads, we don't have these kind of roads in the UK, but then we don't get earthquakes and volcanoes either. 
but they weren't really designed back in the 70s and the 60s to withstand earthquakes. So what they've tried to do is place additional metal structures on the sides to stop these roads from toppling and from dropping the different segments to the ground. They filled in the gaps between the structures, uh, the structure legs to try and make the legs themselves a bit more stronger. And because most of this is made from concrete, they are prone to crack and uh, fall away during earthquakes. So some governments have decided to put metal sheeting around the structure itself to try and keep that concrete in place and stopping it from falling away. Well, that brings our lesson to an end, but continue your own pace by completing the now try tasks for homework. Class dismissed.